is the DeFi enthusiast here. Welcome to the channel. I am so glad to, and honored that we've got one of uh, the crypto OGs here. I, I would say he's, a, he's an OG because he's been in this space since 2013. Um, uh, he is the founder of the world's first decentralized autonomous university called Batopia. He's also an advisor to Unchained Innovations. So it is my real pleasure to have Amin Rafi here with, with us. Amin, over to you. Hey, mate. Thanks for having me over. It's and, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for the introduction as well. Excited to share some knowledge and yeah, hopefully reach uh, your audience with some good tips and uh, also share some knowledge on how they can improve their privacy and a bit about my background as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so uh, how did you get into the crypto space? Like what was the uh, like, like the blockchain space in general? Um, uh, would you like to talk about that? Like, how did it all start? Yeah, sure. It's an interesting story, actually. Uh, in 2013, a friend of mine uh, showed me the Bitcoin white paper. And, you know, I kind of looked over it, thought about the concept. We went and bought our first Bitcoin for 50 Australian dollars. And I felt scammed. I'm like, man, we just gave this guy $50 and there's this number one on our screen. Like, what do we do with this one? You know, can't people, it's like, I, I felt like it was Warcraft money. And uh, I was very skeptical. I was like, I feel like we got scammed. I don't know what this thing is. Who are these people mining? I don't know what's going on. Uh, so I was very skeptical at first. And then I let it go for a bit for a couple of months after that. This was in April, 2013. I went on a bit of a uh, road trip to see around Australia. Uh, through the road trip, I thought about it a bit more. I came back and read the white paper properly this time. And I was like, wow, this is going to change everything. The fact that you have decentralized currency and it's not reliant on a nation, that is huge. It is worth every ounce of my energy. So I had, a, I had two businesses then. One was for IT consulting and uh, another one was for design consulting. Uh, my background is in engineering and I pretty much abandoned everything I was doing and I sat in front of the computer on bitcointalk.org for you know 12 to 15 hours a day because I was in Australia I had to catch the hours which was in the US and Europe and I lost about 15 kilos of body weight I was just nothing mattered to me you know nothing mattered to me and back then things were moving so quickly and it was just very exciting it was for the right reasons. No one back then was in it, you know, for the reasons they later came and joined. It was very authentic and yeah, again, very exciting, very rapid. And I did everything I could, you know, I worked on so many different uh, topics and I learned about so many different old coins, the implementation of blockchain beyond Bitcoin. Of course, back then people were very uh, against the use of a blockchain for anything beyond Bitcoin. Most of the people were Bitcoin maximalists and they got really annoyed that, you know, there's a market cap now for another old coin and all of this should be just on Bitcoin and everything else that's not Bitcoin is a shit coin. And it was interesting for me because I then started working as a journalist and I learned about so many different projects and I was like, hold on, what you guys are saying essentially is in the animal kingdom, the perfect specimen could be, for example, a crocodile or a lion. And that's the only animal that should exist because that's it. After that, there's, there's just no greater uh, pursuit of any other animal. Like, uh, no, every creature in the wild represents an aspect of nature and its power. And we need these old coins because a person might not appreciate Bitcoin and that's okay. But you know what? They might enjoy sharing hard drive space to earn money, which is storage, for example. And they might come into it from that angle. Another one might be using, uh, for example, Ethereum and tokens. They might not like Bitcoin or the storage aspect, but they like, the, you know, the, the token aspect makes sense. Having smart contracts makes sense. So you need all of this because they're all doors into the same, uh, you know, lobby where we can all kind of come together. So unfortunately, you know, humans have this, uh, what would you call it? Uh, almost like a gang mentality of like, yeah, I'm a Bitcoin 
person, I am this, and you know, we tend to identify with the things we like rather than to see them as technology and see them as tools and see what works and what doesn't. And you, then you have this kind of rivalry, um, which happens, you know. I follow Liverpool, I follow, I follow Arsenal. And it's like we love football, is the, is the real essence of it. Um, so in this essence, it, the, the focus really should be we don't like banks, we don't like you know, inflama- inflation, we don't like recession, we don't like money just being printed out of thin air and taxpayers having to pay for it. We, you know, if we really sit down, we don't like, you know, the same things and uh, it can be achieved through multiple avenues, you know. There's more than one way to the top of the mountain, as they say, and uh, that can be achieved through different uh, implementations of a blockchain through different protocols. So it was interesting for me to have that, you know, holistic perspective on the space and watch it kind of grow from there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, when I when I got into the space myself, you know, I, I wasn't really the Bitcoin guy. Everybody was like, oh, you're in crypto, so you must be in Bitcoin. I was like, no, man, I'm actually in various other coins that I find which are, you know, very technologically interesting. And a lot of people gave me very, very strange looks because, you know, that that sense of maximalism is definitely there. And, and I think to an extent, it's still around, you know, like, uh, you know, because... It's kind of like people are like, I don't know, right now, you know, there's so many crazy things that have happened in the last, uh, you know, in 2022 till even now, you know, with this whole, uh, you know, I would say all these scam, scam, scam centralized exchanges and all this nonsense, like the FTX collapse and this and that. And, you know, um, yeah, and and every time this happens, you know, the maxis, they always get happy. They're like, see, we told you it's Bitcoin is the only real thing. I was like, well, yeah, but no, I mean, there's a lot of great stuff out there. I mean, if it got affected by the market, that's not the technology's fault. That's just, you know, bad practices by bad people. That's the way I see it. And uh, that's exactly what we all are fighting for, right? Um, and unfortunately, it's very unfortunate that, you know, we're divided into these communities. While this is that one place where we shouldn't be divided, we should actually be accepting of one another and, uh be okay with it because the end goal is the same, right? Decentralization, more autonomy of your own money, more autonomy of your own wealth, a wealth distribution. We can talk about all that, but I think that's where it's at. And um, unfortunately, somewhere down the road, it's been lost. You know, it's just been, it's all about hype and it's all about fear. And it's all about this and that. So I think, uh, what what are your thoughts on that? Like, like, like do you feel do you feel the space has been somewhat corrupted or do you think that um do you think that there's still a lot of there's there, there's still a lot of good people in this space because every time i talk about crypto to somebody who's not in crypto you know they keep telling me oh the markets are manipulated this and i'm like well yeah so are all the other markets i mean what's that's that's not an excuse right uh that's that's no that's no counter that that's no point but you know, there's like a very negative perception still amongst, especially the older generation for some odd reason. Like they're unable to fathom that, you know, something like this can exist and, you know, people can actually, you know, you know, build wealth with all these different ideas and this and that. So what are your thoughts on that? Like, 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 how do you feel the space uh, like has changed over the years? And like, what do you think should be done that this space can be improved further? Like any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. That's a really good question. And that's something I definitely have focused on. Being in it for so long, you kind of see all the different tricks that are occurring. The most fascinating for me is the dissociation between what is actually happening at the core of it and what the mainstream media kind of uh, shares as what is happening. Uh, There's a massive uh, disconnect between those two realms. And it's important that people really start joining meetups and internal communities to get their news and you know, their source of knowledge rather than uh, mainstream sources. Uh, That's vastly important because the first step into decentralization that I always tell people and I have since 2013 is uh, personal responsibility. The entire concept of decentralization is about personal responsibility. So the first thing anyone needs to do is realize that if you're going to come into this and you really want to be empowered by it, you have to learn to be okay with being responsible for the things you do and the things that take place uh, within the decentralized realm. And that's a bit frightening for people because no system in our society requires such a level of personal responsibility. 
everything has been designed so people are dependent on, uh, for example, the banking system. Something goes wrong, you call up the bank, hey, can you help me? They, there was a transaction that I didn't authorize or know about. Uh, hey, can you please help me, help me, help me? That's how society has been designed. They have compartmentalized people's mind. And whether by design or not, I don't really care. That's the end result. So people, unfortunately, uh, are not autonomous in their ability to be able to go through life and have the skills to not be reliant on external or third-party services. Now, that creates a problem because when you have tools that are decentralized, that are self-empowering, that are sovereign, you suddenly start looking for things to blame when things go wrong. So one of the first natural things people will do be like, this, this isn't for me, you know, it's been hacked. Uh, it's, it's all a scam. You know, you hear all these different things over the years. I mean, 2013, uh, you know, there's been so many different trends. We had animal coins, you know, we had like uh, cat coin, dog coin, kitty coin, uh, you know, a trend that occurred. And then you had Doge and then we had nation coins. There was like Israel coin and uh, Mexico coin and Spain coin and pesos and things like that. And then we had uh, master coins um, with master nodes. So you had like, uh, you know, X, X13, which later became a uh, dark coin, which later became Dash and uh, rebrand, rebrand, rebrand. And uh, we had a lot of different coins that were based on privacy. And we saw that trend come and go. And then later we had, you know, the token, the RC20 tokens that turned out to be like 90% scams. And then we had, uh, uh, you know, the, the DeFi space pop up. And that took a lot of uh, people's focus. And then we had NFTs. So it's the same trend applied to the different long time. So the space is continuously riding on these new trends. And I believe the next one will be uh, these, these Decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, DAOs, uh, which already there's a, a fair amount of hype around, and metaverse kind of topics. And that will be the next cool thing. Um, in terms of how has it changed, it became a lot more commercialized, especially when the price went up. You suddenly had a different audience come in. So originally there was a lot of focus on how this can impact society, use cases, uh, where it can be implemented to benefit uh, people around the world that were victims of high fees and uh, remittance and things like that. And then it became more about, you know, this huddle thing. You know, some guy on bitcointalk.org a long time ago, it spelled hold uh, as H-O-D-L, and it, it just caught on. And, you know, I lived on cryptos since 2013. So I paid my bills with it. I lived on it. I traveled on it. It wasn't this thing that you just get and put it to the side and waiting for the right day to Everyone knows what the fiat system is about. You know, it's a system based on debt and it has caused catastrophes around the world. And the people that can print the money can also print it to go to war. They can print it to devalue people's money. Uh, people's savings have disappeared. A uh, prime example being 2008 financial crisis that stretched over many years across, you know, across the planet. When you see these issues, the natural choice then would be to opt out of using such a system as much as possible. So the original idea for me personally was to use cryptos as much as possible, if not all the time. And that was a great goal of mine. And because of that reason, I implemented it across a lot of different services. So, you know, back then it was much harder. So now it's so easy to use cryptos to pay for things. And people have forgotten that they have this tool available to them. And it's one of the most innovative and powerful tools in modern history. Unfortunately, though, people were brainwashed into this concept of huddle and huddle and just hold on to it. It's going to go up one day, which there is nothing wrong with it. If you put away like a savings account, you know, a portion of it away, so use it, use it for what it's designed to be. Um, though you see examples of it and you kind of, it's a bit upsetting because, you know, there's people that I would be like, hey, you know, if you want, you can, instead of paying me back, you can just send it to me in crypto. And they're like, oh, no, I'm not touching my crypto. And I'm like, but well, you know, you can go buy more. Like, why don't you just have like a couple of thousand in crypto that's used for 
paying bills, for paying friends, for paying for dinner, I don't know, whatever it is, just, it's like cash on hand. It's sort of like if you were to reverse it, going, hey, can you pay me in fiat? And someone's like, oh, no, I'm not touching my fiat because the dollar might collapse and I'm like keeping it in euros. It's like a stupid concept. It's like, that's fine. You can allocate a portion to that theory. Um, on the other hand, you know, have someone had. Uh, so the function and the u- utility of it disappeared a lot. Back then, you know, there was a lot of cafes accepting Bitcoin in Netherlands where I lived. Uh, Arnhem had a lot of different restaurants, cafes, bars, grocery stores where you could pay with Bitcoin. And it was lovely because we would have a Bitcoin meetup. We would all meet there, go to a bar, buy our beers, and then someone would pay for it in Bitcoin. Another bar, someone else would pay for it. And it was beautiful. You could see its function. You had opted out of the fiat system. That's what got me excited. So it changed. I don't know if they infiltrated the space and they shifted people's minds into this concept of it's just a form of asset that you put to the side. It's not for me. You know, you hear these things. It's not even for me. It's for my children. It's like, cool. That's beautiful. Still use it too, you know? Um, So I believe the space got infiltrated and I believe it got commercialized. And I believe people came into it that didn't really know its real function beyond uh, the money making aspect, which is great. Like I love capitalism, you know, people should make money. And that's a beautiful thing with cryptos. Though at the same time, it has a function too. And if it wasn't for the people using it to spend it and pay for things, it wouldn't have any value. How can a cryptocurrency or anything have any value if it's not being used? You know, if gold was just this thing people held on to and it was never traded between countries and banks or people, it wouldn't have any value or we traded on a stock market, like all of these are being traded, right? And that's what gives it the value. Otherwise, it's just this metal that people love and it's just sitting in people's houses with no real application. Uh, so there's definitely been a lot of changes over the years in terms of how people perceive it, how they use it, and uh, how it's taught to people. And uh, yeah, that's, so there's definitely been a lot of changes. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I mean, um, yeah, no, I totally understand, man. Uh, I think, I think the payment, uh, you know, using as a payment is definitely the real use case and, and utility. Uh, for me, I got into this space, like about, I think three or four years ago, I was, I like, uh, like basically it's around the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. That's where, that's where I really started to get into, into crypto. And uh, for me, of course, you know, from a perspective, uh, like the way I saw it was, it's like, you know, Silicon Valley in the early days, right? You know, where you have all these great ideas, you invest in them, you know, you're like part of this movement and, you know, you also, you know, you can, you can potentially make life-changing money. So that is, of course, that is, that is a big, that is of course a big attraction. Um, But the main, the main, the main thing was to have an alternative system. I agree with that. The main thing was decentralization. And I think, the most impressive thing that I keep telling a lot of people, you know, like whenever they say, well, you know, gold is the best investment. I was like, yeah, sure. Gold is awesome. But how much gold can you carry in, you know, from one place to another? That's, that's my main question right now. And, but while, you know, in crypto, you can be carrying whatever amount you potentially have, right. Could be, could be, could be a hundred dollars, could be a million dollars, could be a billion dollars, you know, and, and, you know, it's all transferable, accessible to you, secure, right? Uh, and um, so, you know, which is going to, so that's what I, that, that's the way I feel about this, um, about the space. One of the things that I also want to mention is that somewhere along the line, people forgot that this is a peer-to-peer technology. People became accustomed to using centralized exchanges. And unfortunately, that is the only place that people have ever been uh, hacked in terms of you know losing an exchange losing millions and millions of dollars uh, you got main gox as the first kind of intro into an exchange getting hacked and you know money going missing and there was cripsy and there's been a lot of different ones from back in the days and all the way up to nowadays the reason this happens is that people are bringing their old outdated mentality to a new technology So the way Andres Antonopoulos put it a long time ago is that when you had the first vehicles as opposed to horses and carriages, the roads were built for horses and carriages. 
So you couldn't really understand the benefits of a car when it's being ridden on roads that are built for horses and carriages. Sure, to some degree you can, but you need the roads to be redesigned so therefore you can see the potential of the car. And unfortunately, in people's minds, they are used to this aspect of banking where they go in and sign in with their email address and password. And if something goes missing, you press forgot password and, you know, it's, it's safe. Though they forget that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and uh, platforms and protocols, you are your own bank. You are your own master. There's no one above you. So unfortunately, lots of people go on to centralized exchanges. They pass their power onto another entity. They bring a third party into the situation. Now, I understand why someone would do that if they're trading every day or even every week. So if they're not doing that and they're just trading once a month or they're not even trading at all, then it becomes scary because then you're using a centralized exchange as a bank and you haven't really learned the lesson in the process and the power that you've been given has been diminished in the process. And it's a very poor approach to this new realm. And unfortunately, it's gotten to a point where I have students that I tell this to and they're like, what do you mean? Like you can buy cryptos in person? How do, how do you find these people? And I'm like, it was designed and the original methods of purchasing and selling were in person. Like you would do it with other people you knew. You would go to meetups, meet people. And they're like, there's meetups? Like there's people that come and meet on a weekly basis and they talk about cryptos? I'm like, yes, in every city in the world almost. Um, go find it. Go find your communities and learn from them. Find people you trust, meet them, trade with them. Don't buy off centralized exchanges. And you know, they're like, you know, wow, I had no idea. And that's the level that it's reached to where people have been misinformed about its real uh, use case and its real function. And people love convenience at the same time, right? They love just, here's my ID, here's my bank account. I just want to press this button and buy the crypto. It goes into the centralized exchange, forget about it. And that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate, really. So, once they learn, and my students definitely have learned, you know, I offer a privacy course and a crypto course. And once they learn that, they just see it completely different. They, they see the whole image properly and they're like, wow, I can't believe I've been buying off a centralized exchange. They almost feel like they've been betrayed and kind of uh, tricked into buying it a way that it should have never been purchased and linking their ID to it and all of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make is is that they keep, um, you know, relying on these centralized exchanges. And I and I keep telling people, you know, if it's not your keys, it's not your crypto. And the whole point of crypto is to be away from centralization as much as possible. I know we we're not at that point yet where we can completely get away from you know the fiat system, but that's that was the main goal and unfortunately a lot of people have not you know um they still don't you know they don't realize this they they keep they keep relying on you know these big companies and you know we, we we've seen in the last year that that centralization does not work it's it, it, it's a very very weak and frail system and it's not designed for your interest for your benefits it's designed for only their interest and their interest only and uh, unfortunately, I think, you know, it's just become more about, you know, well, you know, like with most people, they're like, well, yeah, we need some assurity. I'm like, you are your assurity, right? I mean, that's the whole point. You need to be your own assurance. And unfortunately, that's been lost, you know, that's just been lost um, throughout this entire movement. Yeah. So, so what I realize is that, you know, people have lost that along the way and, you know, they keep relying on these things. And, um, you know, I keep telling them that, you know, they are that they are the utility. Yeah. They, they are, uh, you know, they are responsible for their funds. It's not some other entity or some other, uh, you know, organization, but people just keep going back to that. You know, they, they want somebody behind, you know, behind them, taking care of them. And then I keep asking them, then why are you in this space? And they're like, well, we're here to make money. I was like, okay, even if you're here to make money, right, which is fine. It's totally, I mean, it's fair, you know. Um, you still should be responsible for that money. Why are you giving it to, you know, someone else? I mean, I would be very uncomfortable, 
you know, keeping a hundred thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand, a, a million dollars or whatever on a, on a, on a centralized exchange because that could just go away when we already have facilities like uh, like hardware wallets and things like that, you know, to take care of all of this. So, but it's just very unfortunate uh, that you know people still keep relying on these things and. Um, yeah, yeah. So, which also then brings me to, you know, what what you guys are doing. Tell me more about Batopia University, man. Like, uh, what are you guys exactly doing there? What are you teaching? Um, how is this? Uh, like, what is it all about? Please, uh, please, please share your thoughts on that. For sure, and thanks for bringing that up. So, Batopia University actually started very similarly to what you said. The the idea that people have forgotten what it was like. To be empowered by cryptocurrencies and they've given that power away and how easily that power has been given away so my journey began with the idea and confusion a state of confusion as to why 10 years after bitcoin is you know available uh, more than 10 years now why aren't people using it why are people so confused as to why what this is why are people so confused on peer-to-peer -peer trading and the benefits of cryptocurrency. Why is there so much confusion? I still am baffled by it that if this was created by Apple or if it was created by you know, Bank of America or some centralized heavy duty uh, organization, everyone would know about it and everyone would be using it. Though it seems because it's this decentralized technology and it's peer to peer and it's bottom up, there's so much confusion about it to the point where nowadays people are even confusing it with the central bank digital currency. And they're like, don't use cryptos, cryptos are evil. And I'm like, what? When did they become evil? And they're like, oh, they'll monitor everything you do. I'm like, no, hold on. You're confusing two very different things. You know, an example would be like, don't use operating systems, they spy on you. It's like, which one? Which one are we talking about? Are we talking about Linux, Windows, Mac, which one? Can we break it down a bit? Or it's like cars are bad. Which car? Are we talking about diesel, electric, petrol? Which car? So we need to be specific in what we're talking about. So unfortunately, people now deem cryptos as evil because of central bank digital currency. And that's unfortunate. So Bitopia came about from this state of confusion as to what is going on. And my hypothesis was that it's knowledge. It's access to education. And that needs to be kind of uh, reapproached. And unfortunately, the space includes a lot of people that are tech minded and unable to express those ideas in a way that, let's say, someone that has no tech background can grasp and digest. And I ran a kind of a workshop in Mexico with 30 or 40 expats and also local people. And I wanted to find out why they still didn't use cryptos. And we did a word map and a word cloud, sorry. And uh, from that, we wanted to kind of gather what is the main aspects of limiting people from using cryptocurrency. And, you know, my hypothesis was correct, which was knowledge, you know, 90% plus uh, deemed knowledge to be their barrier as to why they haven't used it. Uh, so therefore it proved the hypothesis that Utopia can move forward with implementing a decentralized form of education, which shouldn't say incentivize, as well as many other things. So as a system architect of Bitopia, I saw that most of the prevalent industries in our societies are top down. Now, whether it's pharmaceutical, whether it's education, whether it's, uh, you know, the financial industry and uh, a lot of other things, they're all top down. Now, what does that mean? So if you have like a pyramid at the top of it would be the uh, top down approach. So you have, for example, in a pharmaceutical company, uh, the pharmaceutical companies and at the bottom you have the people. Uh, in education, you have the educational industry and, uh, you know, at the bottom, again, the people. Financial system, you have the uh, Federal Reserve, you have central banks, uh, you have the other institutions like the IMF, European Central Bank, and then the World Bank, and then you have, like, uh, national banks, and then you have the people again. In all of these systems, now let's remove conspiracy, let's remove uh, politics, let's remove any form of ideology and look at it from an engineering perspective. In all these systems, the systematic risk is passed to the end user, meaning pharmaceutical, 
for companies make mistakes, who pays the bill? People with their lives. Uh, financial system collapses, something goes wrong, who pays the bill? The people, taxpayers. Uh, you know, education. Let's say people go through all these education systems, come out the other side, they're not really happy about what they learn. Who pays the bill? The students. So the way I like to kind of approach it is if you had a self-driving car that would put at risk the people inside the car to save itself, how many people would buy that car? No one. No one would want to be sitting in a car that would prioritize itself over the passengers. It's just crazy. If an engineer built that, people would be like, you're off your head. Like, what is wrong with you? Why would you have designed it like that? So that is the way most of our most powerful industries have been shaped where as an end user or as a customer, as a client, as a citizen, you, you know, all the risk is passed on to these people, us. And that is a poor way to design it. Now, again, I'm not getting into ideology and all of this. It's just poorly designed. From an engineering perspective, that is a poor way to design a system. So we can see how Bitcoin came into the picture and it flipped the story upside down. It put people at the top and then the industry is at the bottom. And we can do the same, in my opinion, uh, with the education system. So all of these education systems, well, it doesn't matter if it's Coursera, it doesn't matter if it's uh, you know, any of these platforms either. There's no empowerment for students. So we run a simulation in terms of what happens if we take the tuition that comes into the students and we put it into a decentralized treasury. And that decentralized treasury then provides an income to the top students. If not, it empowers them to become entrepreneurs and use that money from the treasury to develop their ideas and uh, develop businesses that would then come back and fund that particular course or field of study or society that they're a part of. Now that's interesting because then I come as a student, I put $5,000 down to do a course. And if I rank well, not only do I get my 5,000 back, I could even double or triple my money. I could even have access to a mentor, a network of mentors and entrepreneurs to come and say, well, I just studied this and I have this brilliant idea. Are you willing to fund it? And as a, organization as people that are part of that particular society they can be like sure what's your plan send us your business plan okay it was going to cost twenty thousand dollars i'm going to give fifty percent of it back to the society and fifty percent of it for myself to develop it people go and vote on it as they do on a DAO, and suddenly you make education very interesting you incentivize the education process and the students that do well you open up doorways where the tuition can create a pool or a treasury they can fund uh, entrepreneurs and it empowers the students to go out and actually do something with the knowledge that they have learned rather than just go and work for someone because they're like well i finished university i have a hundred thousand dollars there but of course i'm going to go work for google or facebook and they'll never come out of that once they have that google or facebook salary they're never coming out of that you know so our brightest minds are being thrown into these organizations or companies that are really not doing great things for society, quite the opposite. And I would much rather be able to empower them so they never even consider that as an option and go on to become entrepreneurs and create their own uh, companies or organizations. And that's really what Bitopia is about. It's about incentivizing students, taking their tuition and creating this beautiful world out of it. And we've been doing it. We've you know, funded scholarships from the tuition. We've been able to uh, incentivize the top students or that are really contributing and helping other students uh, into attending another course for free because of the way they've contributed. And if a person can't attend the course, let's say someone is living in one side of the world and the university they want to go to is on the other side, you know, that's a lot of movement. What happens if we create an opportunity for people to earn their way into a course? So if I wanted to go to Harvard, I don't have the money unless I get a scholarship and I do really well, that's one way to get into Harvard. That's really difficult. But what if I was like, hey, Harvard, I'm great at social media and uh, I want to go and market some of your courses and tell people about your, you know, the topics that you do and bring in some students. Can that fund my tuition? Of course, it's never going to happen at Harvard. So with Bitopia and the protocols we're developing, you will be able to do that. So if you don't have the funds to study a course, guess what? Go and bring people in that will join and do a particular course. Go and spread the word, hold meetings, like prove your way and earn your way into a course.
So it changes the dynamics of education greatly. On top of that, uh, we have open source curriculum. So if there's an update to a course, just like a software, you'll get, uh, you know, once it's developed, you'll get an update and you'll be like, okay, the course that I studied just received an update. Let's do the updated version of what's been added to the curriculum. Or hey, uh, the top students become board members of that particular society or course. Um, and they can vote on changes. They can vote, you know, similar to a DAO concept where you apply it to education. And these are really empowering uh, functions of this particular uh, project. Wow, that, that, that's amazing. I mean, th that's a lot of stuff that you guys are working on and, and it's really, really fascinating the way you've uh, thought about this. I think it's brilliant. Um, and um, which also brings me to this question that, um, so you guys are basically dealing with education as a whole, right? Like not just for blockchain-based education, but also education as a whole. And that's, that's, and that's the goal here. I mean, that means education in the arts, education in... Um, sciences, education, and whatever field that is possible, but through a decentralized autonomous means, through decentralized That's autonomous exactly means. That's exactly correct. Yeah, okay. think of it as like Ethereum and Vitalik, and someone's like, hey, did you create Ethereum just for DeFi? And he's like, no, I've created the network. People can create DeFi, NFTs. They can create ERC tokens. It's up to them. Are you only supporting um, blockchain projects? It's like, no, they can be anything. So in the same way, any sort of field can come onto a Bitopian hosted. And uh, we just, you know, we, we won an award from Swarm Grant, uh, which helps us kind of develop further without bringing VCs into it. At one stage, we'll open it up. Um, and private investors are always welcome. It's just we don't want to change it too much because it will lose its uh, original function. And we've done really well. We've even partnered up with a university out of uh, Switzerland to develop a course on DAOs. Uh, we did that last year. That was brilliant. The students got access to, you know, a very updated field of knowledge that no other university has really access to. And it is, like you said, beyond blockchain. And my, you know, as much as anyone can come and kind of propose their idea of what courses should be under, the most exciting thing for me personally is the cancel culture. Why is there so many forms of knowledge being wiped off from mainstream platforms? Why? They have millions of followers, some of these people. That means there's millions of people who are interested in what they have to teach. So whose business is it that these people want to learn these things? You know, I, I don't know who suddenly at some stage flicked the switch and said, no, unless we agree that these topics are uh, worthy by our standards, we have to cancel you out. That's not how education works. That's not how knowledge works. You don't get to dictate what form of knowledge is approved and authenticated and which one should be wiped off every single mainstream platforms such as YouTube, Spotify, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you just don't have that sort of a power, though they abuse that power. And that's where I see really a niche, because we can go and approach people that have a wealth of knowledge that have been cancelled and bring them onto a platform where they're protected by blockchain protocols and systems of protection that it offers, such as immutability, such as protection of their knowledge, and uh, really perpetual learning can come into play where people can access things that universities just will never offer and that for me is very very exciting because there's so much out there that people just don't have access to that you're not going to find on Coursera or Udemy or any university you know it really stems from Aaron Swartz do you know Aaron Swartz no I'm uh, please uh, elaborate on that yeah please. So he was one of the founders of Reddit at the very early age. You, you know, there's a documentary um, called Internet's Own Boy. And he, wow. he was a genius. And he, he fought so much to protect uh, uh, knowledge and access to knowledge. And his whole idea was we need to remove the privatization of knowledge. Because there's so many public universities that have research papers, though you need to, you know, you need to go past the paywall to access them. And he was like, why should we have to do that if a public university should be publicly accessible and you're limiting people's ability to access them? Um, that was one of his things. So, you know, he's a very deep guy and I highly recommend people look into him. So he was really against the privatization of knowledge and that is kind of one of the pillars of utopia really to reverse that and give people access to knowledge. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um... I absolutely agree with you. I mean, uh, this is this is really really fascinating, man. Um, and what I what I realized is that 
I think it's really, really important um, to be um, with what are you with, with what are you doing? Because uh, speaking of cancel culture, I think you know it's over the years it's just been uh, like it's been blown out of proportion. I, I feel you know this whole censorship, especially if you notice in the last three years, you know uh, so much censorship has taken place. So many alternative views have been censored. So many uh, you know medical professionals have been censored. You know, because, you know, the, you know, I, I of course, I'm not going to get into this too much because obviously YouTube, unfortunately, doesn't, you know, is not too forthcoming when it comes to these sort of topics. And this is exactly the point that, 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 you know, you and I are trying to make here as well is uh, that we need more decentralization. We need less censorship. And uh, which brings me to, uh, and we, of course, we need more privacy because uh, most of our data is being, you know, uh, being misused by these big organizations for their own benefits. And this brings me back, how does how does Bitopia connect to Unchained Innovations? Would you like to talk about Unchained Innovations, please? I, I know you're an advisor with them. And, uh, you know, uh, I looked into Unchained Innovations. I was very, very fascinated, uh, of, you know, some of these uh, devices that they're, they've been making. So, you know, I, I would love, I'd love, I'd love for you to talk about that as well. Sure. And thank you for bringing that up as well. So when you really look at decentralized protocols and uh, blockchains and these networks that have come about, you really realize at the core of them, they relate back to a peer-to-peer -peer system by which two people or more can transact or share information without any third party surveilling them, getting in the way, or being able to stop them. Now, if you zoom out, you'll realize that that represents privacy. That represents a society in which two people can interact and their business remains private and confidential. Now, that's very important. So Bitcoin, if it was used in its original form without a centralized exchange, and people knew how to use it properly, is quite private. Now, that has been tainted due to third-party services offering a way for people to uh, obtain Bitcoin and transact with Bitcoin, uh, which unfortunately adds a identity layer to that. The, the idea behind this is that we create a system by, through which people can transact with one another without uh, any sort of uh, surveillance or people being able to uh, limit or stop those transactions. So privacy is at the core of any peer-to-peer -peer system and cryptocurrencies as well. Now that has changed over the years and I'm sure there's peer-to-peer -peer systems that may not function like that. The majority really are uh, the cornerstone are privacy. So privacy is very important. And if you truly look at capitalism and perhaps anarcho-capitalism as well, you realize that privacy is a very big part of it. At the end of the day, it means that two people can transact with one another without the experience of a third party, whether it's government or another institution or organization. So privacy is also very important to have a free society. And that's something that people forget. And people's minds have been hijacked to the point nowadays where majority say, well, if you have nothing to hide, why does it matter? Now, that is a, there's two things wrong with that. First of all, I don't believe most of the people that say that truly believe that. Because if they believe that, then they would be okay with me coming and staring through their living room window all day. I could even, should be able to set up cameras around their house. You know, walk up to street, on, walk, walk up to someone on the street with your phone and try and record. See how they react. See if they'll appreciate that. Go onto a train or a bus on the street, just get your phone and start recording them and stand in front of them. If they freak out, are they doing something wrong? Are they criminals because they, you know, they freaked out and they're like telling you to stop? Is that the only reason people would not appreciate you doing that? So if you really sit down with a person that uses that kind of a phrase, if you got nothing to hide, it doesn't matter, and really go through the layers and go deep with them, you'll come to realize that that's not really what they think. It's just a slogan that's been kind of, you know, put into their mind. Their mind has been hacked. And this has been put into it. There is many reasons why we have privacy. Now, if a person enjoys a free society, they have to 
they have to value privacy because you can't exchange ideas and do it in a way where you're not gonna someone's not gonna find your house and like shoot you for proposing a new idea that's against everyone else's uh, perhaps way of thinking without privacy you need privacy to be able to exchange and share and discuss and and uh, really debate ideas that's how we have gotten to a point where society includes so many different types of people and privacy is at the center of any free society you will not be able to find a free society that does not respect people's privacy. It just doesn't work. So I really like to show that to people because you know we have, I, you know, again, I teach privacy to a lot of students. We have courses on this, and they have to learn why privacy is important before we even go into what tools they should use, what browsers they should use, what phone they should use, what laptop, what operating system, messaging applications, email applications. Like it doesn't matter. Let's not even get into that. Let's figure out why privacy is important. Over 130 countries around the world have some sort of a legislation or covenant uh, exploring the reasons as to why privacy matters. You know, you got the international uh, laws on it. You got the UN declaration. Of it. And, uh, you know, on a national level, you also have a lot of nations that have privacy laws. Like in Australia, we have the Privacy Act, which is that companies and organizations have to adhere to certain rules when they're dealing with customer information. You know, this it's such a big part of our lives. So once we break that kind of uh, uh, dogma around it, where people feel like only criminals want privacy, which is absolutely garbage. You could be a medical doctor, you could be a lawyer, you could be a police officer, you could have patient records, you could have confidential information on your clients. There's so many reasons why you need privacy. And uh, you need to be able to protect your clients and your contacts and network. Uh, that, that the idea that only if you have nothing to, you know, if you're not doing anything wrong, it shouldn't matter. It's just, it just seems, it, it just, it's just stupid is the best and cleanest way I can put it. So then we go into the other layer, layer which is how do we help people uh, learn about privacy and get involved with it and learn the importance of it and move forward? That's where Unchained Innovation came about because we saw that there was a very real need for people to edu be educated on what tools are available. There's a lot of fear mongers out there that are like, the world is going down this path. Look what they're doing. Look what the banks are doing. Look what the government is doing, which is fair. The, let's also look at all the tools we have available to us. You know, I remember in the early days when people like David Icke and later, you know, almost anyone on YouTube was, you know, uh, kicked off or banned because of what they were saying. They were all like, we got banned on YouTube. Ah. And I'm like, of course you did. Like, what else did you think was going to happen? It's like going into a mosque and preaching Christianity. Do you, like, of course, you're going to get kicked out. This is their house. How did you not have a backup plan? You know, you are, in essence, in need of reflecting rather than screaming at them like they're the bad guy. You know their nature. You know, it's like uh, Sun Tzu's law, know thyself, know thy enemy. Of course, they're going to kick you out. You should even be like, wow, I got away with that for a while, didn't I? You know, they allowed me to say whatever I wanted for two or three years. Like, you should be happy they even let you speak about all these things that go against their, uh, you know, uh, ideologies for so long. So I was surprised that people found it surprising that they were like, oh, I'm getting kicked off YouTube. Um, it's like, of course. So Unchanged Innovation in a nutshell, came about as a form of allowing people to really see what tools are available and really giving them access to these tools in a way that's digestible. Because there are a lot of people within the privacy space, again, technically minded, unable to express it in a way that easily digestible. And we often have people that are like, what, well, you know, there's this tool, why isn't everyone using, for example, conversation? And I'm like, People are on Facebook Messenger. They're still trying to figure out how to go from that to Telegram. You know, in your mind, it might be easy to be like, oh, you just download this app and, you know, you do this thing and you put in, go onto terminal and download this script and it does it to you. I don't understand why isn't everyone doing this, you know? And that's what happens when you live in the bubble. Things seem very easy. It's like, for me, I've used cryptocurrencies for over 10 years. For over a decade, I've used them and thought about it. So for me, it's very different to the person that's just heard about cryptos. And it's like, what's a wallet? What's a private key? What's mining? 
you know, I don't want to think about this. I'll go on to a centralized exchange. So Unchained Innovations was very successful establishing itself as a pioneer in terms of offering devices uh, where people can use open source devices and use a operating system that was built for privacy. So uh, on all the phones, uh, Graphene OS is used and Graphene OS is the most secure and powerful operating system on mobile phones available today. And we also offer laptops that are Linux based. So you are pretty much opting out of mass surveillance out of big tech companies. You are removing yourself from data collection, contributing to AI empowerment. I mean, if you go and look at Google's AI, I forget what it was called, 50% of its data came from public, publicly accessible social media outlets or platforms. You know, that's really fascinating. If people really sit down and figure out, if you want an AI, you're gonna need data. So if you really look at the engineer's mind, you'll realize that social media didn't come about to help people connect. It came about because their end goal was an AI system. And how do you create an AI system to be very powerful? You need data. You need lots and lots of lots of data. And you need to know how people think, how they react to certain topics how they react to certain comments, what kind of content they share, their opinions, their ideas. Well, how do we get them to share that with us without, it making, without making it look suspicious? Let's call it social media. Let's call it Facebook and let's make it free. And let's call it connecting people around the world and giving you access to speak to your family. Guess what? In the process, they collected all of that and fed it to an AI. If we didn't have social media, and the way that people publicly express all their thoughts and ideas and images and photos and all of this, AI would have no power. It would be such a weak, in a weak state. So once you understand that, you realize the best way to defeat anything that goes against humanity is to limit the amount of information you publicly express and share with big tech and these organizations that collect it. Then it became, becomes a much more approachable matter. And we really, you know, through Unchained Innovation, uh, we have an amazing support panel where people can go and learn how to use these uh, phones and laptops because that can be a, a kind of a limitation for people. They're like, well, I like the sound of all these tools. I don't know how to use it. Uh, so we really show people, all right, if you're coming from Mac, this is how you export your contacts, your details. This is how you import it into the Graphene or Ninja phone, as uh, we call it in Unchained Innovation. And uh, with laptops, you know, what are you looking for? Most people just use a laptop for browsing, emails, and some documents. You can do all of that on Linux. You don't need to have any fears as to a learning curve and it might be difficult. Once you use Linux, you really realize how powerful it is and how beautiful it is. And these systems, none of them are built on, you know, big tech uh, principles. So they're not using you as a tool of collecting information. So one thing I like to say to people is you, you have to understand the difference between you know, sometimes people say, well, if it's free, you're the product. That doesn't apply to free software. There's a difference between free as in freedom and proprietary software, which is freely accessible. You know, free as in freedom is what Linux is, is what Bitcoin's uh, source code is. The reason we have so many cryptocurrencies is because Bitcoin was open source. The reason we have so many versions and types of Linux is because it's open source. That's how nature works. That's why we have so many different types of, for example, uh, recipes of the same type of food. It's because it's open source. People can see the recipe and uh, make it in their own way based on their own vision. And open source is very important for that. Uh, so in a nutshell, again, Unchained Innovations came about as a way of approaching people and giving them access to and knowledge about uh, open source privacy and secure based uh, applications. We were able to actually uh, you know, Cliff High uh, was one of the people that used uh, Unchained Innovation and got one of the phones. Uh, I don't know if you know Cliff High is a great uh, speaker. And uh, a lot of other uh, powerful people have reached out. And, you know, these phones have been sent all around the world. And people really appreciate it, being able to just opt out of this big tech realm and enter a world where uh, things are transparent, you know, things are clear. They're no longer buying a car that you can't even open the bonnet and see what's in the engine bay. You know, that's, that's what Facebook and all these uh, 
proprietary tools are, they're literally cars that people are buying without even checking the engine because they're like, you can't look inside of it, trust us, it's good. Uh, whereas when you use open source tools, it's the ability to be able to look at it and know what's inside of it and know what you're getting. So, uh, and it's been very successful. Uh, privacy is something that people are starting to realize the importance of more and more each day and Unchained Innovations, um, you know, there's Telegram groups people can check out, um, jump on there and access a lot of different things. You know, there's continuously uh, topics that get explored, such as what messaging applications to use, comparing different wallets, non-custodial versus custodial, why certain wallets are better for some people, and uh, what security tools they offer, what privacy features they have, what to look out for. Uh, I think one of the recent ones, for example, uh, covered, uh, for example, why people shouldn't use Exodus as a wallet because it's proprietary. Yes, it's really easy to use. It's beautiful. It, the interface is great. So, and a lot of people use it for those reasons. Though uh, it's not open source. So all the transactions that you know are happening through Exodus, potentially all the IP addresses are getting logged. There's uh, you know uh, a lot of information being collected as to what is being transacted from where and who's holding what kind of cryptos. We don't have any assurance as to perhaps these wallets not uh, collecting that information because it's not open source. And uh, another one that was really interesting was, for example, Ledger versus uh, Trezor. You know, these hardware wallets that people use. And, uh, you know, we, we explained to people Ledger is actually not open source. Trezor is open source both the hardware and the software, meaning that uh, it's, it's publicly accessible. You can replicate it. If Trezor disappears, the project won't die. People can continue to make these hardware wallets. Whereas Ledger is very dependent on the company itself because it's a proprietary software and uh, it's not fully open source. And you, you know, if I was keeping a large amount of money on a hardware wallet, I would not feel comfortable holding it on a wallet that is not open source. Uh, that's that's just a fact. So I believe. Once people realize the value of privacy, they'll realize the importance of applying it to as many aspects of their lives as they can. And there's a defeatist mentality within some people, which is like, oh, they're collecting information anyway, who cares? They have everything on me anyway. You know, who, who cares? You know, some people say this. That's the same as saying, well, there's toxic food inside some ingredients, uh, toxic ingredients inside some food. Who cares? Let's just eat whatever's, whatever's there. Well, that's that's a poor approach. That's a defeatist mentality that like, I just give up. You know, it's not a very good approach. So our service is for people that are uh, entrepreneurs and people that really value their time and just want a good service and a good support uh, process that can help them uh, onboard and bring their old contacts or anything else uh, across and uh, people that value their time. So we work with a lot of entrepreneurs and coaches and business mentors and, and uh, you know, some amazing people that really see the value of privacy and enjoy using these devices and uh, also the different tools that we recommend to them. Uh, so through Unchained Innovations, they actually have an option where you can come and be like, well, these are the tools that I use on a daily basis for my business. Is there a way for me to stop using them? Um, are there alternatives, friendly alternatives? And that's provided as a you know, add-on service as well, which definitely makes on-chain innovation stand on top of whoever else is offering similar tools and services. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. And um, I think I think uh, what what on-chain uh, on-chain innovations are doing are doing, and what Bitopia is doing is is revolutionary in many ways. And I think it's gonna. I think it's still gonna it's gonna take some years for people to to really catch on to this. But I think the sooner people get onto devices like these and you know they start using things, uh, you know like like, like the Bitopia platform and also on chain innovations, I think the sooner people get into that, the better it will be for all of society, in my opinion. Um, so tell me uh, one one thing that uh, when I was looking at some of your phones, because I I myself. Well, plan to you know you know get 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 one of your devices very soon. So, um, personally, what would you say? Like like I noticed, that, which is great. Something you guys have there is like the um, the reduction of EMFs, right? Like you're not like 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 you don't have to be 
connected to the 5G uh, space and and stuff like that. Like you know, with, uh, you know, we all know the harms of 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 uh, electromagnetic frequencies, right? So, uh, how will that affect the internet speeds on these devices, though? That's the, that that that's something that you know a lot of people you know ask me sometimes. Would you like to elaborate on that, please? Sure, uh, that's an important thing to bring up, and so there's two reasons why you'll be able to switch the network mode. The first one being that you have things like Stingray, which is the cell broadcasting. Uh, let's say uh, what police officers would do is set up a fake uh, network within a certain area. So a fake cell tower, you could call it. So originally, you know, you have your phone, it connects to a cell tower, that's how it connects to the telecommunication network, and you're able to access the internet and make calls if you did call. And this connection can be replicated by an officer that has these certain devices because it, uh, it mimics the same kind of service. So your phone thinks, oh, great, there's the network, let me connect to it. And the moment you do, they're able to access, you know, what kind of phone calls you're making, what kind of messages, and the, the IME number of your phone. A lot of different details can come through um, depending on where it's used and how it's used. So by limiting, these traditionally worked on 2G and 3G networks. And because of the encryption layer offered by 4G, uh, it became harder to do that. So one of the features of the phone is that you can select the phone to work on 4G or LTE mode only. That already reduces uh, a lot of ways that a phone could be tracked or you know kind of hacked to uh, reveal certain information. The other aspect is that certain people don't like using or accessing 5G towers or 5G frequencies, and that's fair. You know, everyone has their own opinion on it. At the end of the day, let's give them the option. You know, and I think that's the best approach that anyone can have in society. It's like let's not fight with people. That's a certain thing. There's a lot of uh, data and publications out there that show the dangers of 5G and even 4G or 3G, all of them have some sort of a, uh, let's say, uh, negative attribution that people should be aware of. So by allowing the phone to only work on LTE mode, you limit its uh, connectivity to 5G frequencies. You also limit its, uh, the dangers of, for example, the, uh, the issues around uh, fake cell towers collecting people's information. So there was an article recently posted how the intelligence agencies used this as a way of collecting you know, people's uh, communication data uh, without public even knowing. It was actually illegal the way they did it in terms of uh, surveillance. So that's a really great feature of the phone. You can set it on LTE mode only, you can limit its uh, capabilities so it's not connecting to 5G and uh, that's, that's a really good first step. These phones have so many features that it's kind of like hard to go and like explore it all. All I can tell you is once you use it, you look at your original phone, whether it's, it was an iPhone or Samsung, or LG, whatever it was, and you realize that you were almost scammed. It's like coming from fiat and using crypto and you're like, whoa, you know, there's this tool available. So what I just said is one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is, for example, you can limit an application's access to the storage of the phone based on what you, uh, what you uh, kind of give it access to. So let's say you download WhatsApp on your phone. Why should it have access to everything that's on your phone in terms of storage access? So what you can do is create a folder called WhatsApp on your storage, and it only sees that folder. Now, that's very interesting because it no longer has access to kind of go through all your photos or files or anything else. All it thinks is that's all there is on the phone. Now that's beautiful. So you can limit access based on what app you're using in that way. Uh, you have profiles on the phone, meaning that you can have a work profile and a personal profile. Work could be, all right, look, I do need to use Instagram. I do need to use WhatsApp. I do need to use Uber, which is fair. We're dealing with people, sometimes entrepreneurs, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, coaches, sometimes regular people, they use certain apps they have to for their work. Let's segregate those apps and put them on a different profile. So once work is done, you switch off that profile, you're back into your personal mode, and you don't have any of these big tech apps on your normal profile. So that's really great approach to system as well, where you segregate two different parts of uh, the, the phone into having profiles. And you know, once something is on a certain profile, that's all it has access to. So if you have a VPN app, you do need to put it on both profiles. 
uh, you know, there's certain things that you need to keep in mind. If you take photos on one, at, uh, one side of the profile, obviously it's not going to be accessed on the other side. So it's, it becomes completely like two different phones. And, you, you know, that, that's really cool. But it also has cool features, which is like, all right, I've already installed these apps. Can you please bring it over to the new profile? So it, you know, it saves you time from having to start from scratch and install everything again on the new profile. Um, these are some aspects. You can switch off microphone and uh, video access completely. So no app has access to it. You know, sometimes I forget to switch it on, for example, and I go to send someone a voice message on Signal and it's just like mute and they're like, I don't know what you were trying to say, but I think there was no audio. So uh, it has certain tools that are very, very useful and you can control permissions per application as well. So if I install, for example, uh, let's say if I was to use Google Authenticator, though I don't, uh, if you were to use Google Authenticator, why should it have access to your microphone or any anything? It should have access to nothing. You know, certain things that you download should have access to nothing. No network access, no mic access, no video access. So you can actually control permissions on an app-to-app -app basis. You can control storage access on an app-to-app -app basis. And these are things that you can actually see. So behind the scenes, it has so many uh, security and privacy features that it's unbelievable. So Cliff High actually bought one and he did a test on it in terms of bandwidth and connectivity. And he goes, it's ridiculous. Like it's such a huge drop in bandwidth usage because the phone is not constantly communicating with Google and sending all this information back or you know, other entities that it may communicate with. So some aspects of it, you're not going to be able to see uh, you know, directly, though you know, that, that's the case with most uh, technological uh, protocols. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, that's those are some jam-packed features in there, and uh, I think I think a lot of people would be very much uh, like I think people, especially I think even in the blockchain space. How do you feel? How do you feel this connects to the crypto world as well? Like, um, like um, are, are are the phones very crypto friendly as well? At the same time, like uh, they have different wallet integrations and things. Like, like, or is it going to be like complicated? Because uh, for me personally, I never do crypto on my phone, for example. You know, like for me, it's always been the laptops. Uh, I still stick to the laptops. I'm like, you know, don't, I know a lot of people still love doing the, this on their phones. And, and what I realize is that they, they're at a loss, you know, a lot of times by, by, you know, doing, doing, doing these sort of things because, uh, you know, they lose money or something happens, something goes wrong. And you know it's it's these phones they can easily be hacked and stuff. So how do you feel? Uh, how do you feel that would you would you be able to transact and do whatever crypto activity on these phones very safely and uh, and are they easily in, uh, integrated with all the current DApps that, that that are linked with with the crypto in the in the cryptocurrency space? Sure. So the the simple answer is yes, and I'll explain very quickly why. If you're a fan of cryptocurrencies, you're a fan of open source software. That's just as simple as it gets. Most, if most of the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all of these are open source and they're open source for a reason, which makes them verifiable and makes them trustless. A trusted application would be like WhatsApp, which says, hey, we offer end-to-end -end encryption for calls and messages, but guess what? We're not open source, trust us. It's happening, you're, you're protected. So that's where you introduce trust. And we want to use tools that are trustless. So for example, the Trezor wallet is open source hardware and software. So on both of these cases, it means that it is trustless. It, it, it's, these are attributions of decentralization and they're very important. So the same with this phone, for example, there was phones called clear phones. People were like, oh, it's great for privacy. So, most of the development was done, if not all of it, by uh, the, the company that was behind Clearphone. Graphene OS is decentralized. People are contributing to it from all around the world. It's not reliant on one company. So that's a huge step forward already. It's open source, just like Bitcoin is. Anyone around the world can look at the code base, contribute to it, uh, examine it, verify it, audit it if they need to. That's a huge step forward. No other phone, if that people are going and buying in the store are like that. Sure, Android is open source, though it comes with bloatware. In most cases, you can't even remove this bloatware. So if you buy LG, it will have 
basic apps by LG on there. If you buy Samsung, it will have apps from Samsung on there, which may be, be able to disable, but you can't really remove them. You have, for example, the Google search bar, which some phones can't even remove on it. You have the Google, uh, you know, s uh, speech to activate certain things or commands, uh, which you can't fully be sure that it's removed from your phone. For example, instead of searching with type, you know, you can say, Help, okay, Google, or hello, Google, and say what you need to to the phone. Or Siri, for example, um, on uh, Apple phones. So these are all protocols that have access to your microphone, they have access to what applications are on there. Apple itself sends a command back to Apple every few seconds. It pings its own uh, servers. Google the same. So there's so many things that are on these traditional phones that go against the principles of decentralization and open source. So these phones are already a step forward because they don't come with that bloater. So you'll notice that your battery actually lasts longer. Your phone is actually quicker and uh, there's much less data being used. And at the same time, if you do it properly, you can run any app that you want. So a great feature and that you mentioned, can you run all these apps that are out there? Most of them that don't require Google services will run without any issue. If an app requires Google services, which would be strange for a crypto app to require it, though, for example, crypto.com, if you use that wallet, for example, uh, that requires Google services for the way that it signs in, I believe. In that case, these phones offer a sandbox version of Google Play, which means that you have Google Play services without it having intrusive permissions on your phone. So that's beautiful. Now you can run any app that you want without those limitations if you needed to by enabling Google services, but a sandbox version of it, meaning that it doesn't have those traditional uh, privileges uh, that a traditional phone would have. So then, yes, you can use any app that you want. At that point, you have no excuse why a person hasn't shifted over to it, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. That That's amazing. I mean, I mean, uh, this is like, uh, yeah, this is, this, this is what I call revolutionary. I mean, uh, I would love to use a device like this personally because uh, I like, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in the blockchain space. I like privacy. You know, no matter, no matter, even if I'm not doing anything wrong, you know, which is what we were talking about earlier, that, you know, people have this perception that, you know, just because you want privacy, it's like you're doing something wrong or illegal. And I think that's utter nonsense. And, you know, you gave a great argument to, towards that, which also brings me to the point, do you feel there's like a, um, there, there's a big market for these sort of things right now? Like, like, do you feel people are actually going, are going to be willing to pay for this? Uh, pay pay for something like this uh, because uh, because you know the a lot of people what I what I what I realize is that a lot of people don't notice how their data is being manipulated how it is you know being misused and 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 the Chinese form phone market is huge it's massive right uh, and you know they've they have basically even given a you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, a, a really hard time to bigger companies that are, you know, giving the same type of features. But of course, you know, the Chinese phones are completely, completely compromised. And we, and we, and I think we can both agree on that. Like, like every phone, every, every big tech company is compromised to a certain extent, but the Chinese phones are totally compromised. Like everything goes to their, you know, data services and every single thing. And it's like, you know, you have zero privacy whatsoever, right? Not but just phones, routers, uh, video surveillance devices, like so many things, smart devices, so many things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, and people, but 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 people are willing to pay for those because they have a really great price point and they have all these features and that's all they care about. So how would Unchain Innovations try to get you know to those people, you know, to to make them realize that you know, hey, you know, you, you know, what you're paying for is you know, it's it's like. You're, you're you're giving them so much more than what you're actually paying for. How would how would you how would Unchained Innovations translate this? Because especially in the third world, you know, where economies are actually you know collapsing, right? You know, you have this, you know, the entire fiat system is completely destroyed here. Like you know, when you when when you convert local currencies here, for example, in, in India or Pakistan or wherever they are, um, like you know, people are just you know their savings are getting 
you know, you know, have, have less buying power and stuff. So how would you reach out to a, you know, audience on a global level and try to get, get, get it through? Like, do you guys have a strategy for this? Sure. That's a very important question because you're right. There are a lot of different people in the world with different budgets. And how do you address that on a planetary level where you want to have this in the hands of as many people as possible? Okay. Now, that is not our goal. Our goal with Unchained Innovation are the people that ask how much is it as the last question, not the first question. So automatically, if the first thing that people ask us is how much is it, they're already not our client because they have come about it in the wrong way. It's what does it offer? What are the benefits? What can I do on it that I can't do on my phone right now? What can't I do on it that I can do on my phone right now? Are there any issues in terms of transitioning from my phone to that phone? What's the support like? You know, these are the questions really that we would like our clients to be asked. And then, okay, how much is it going to cost me? Now that's a great client for us and that's the right fit. So as an organization, you know, the, I, I have a, a business coach that taught me a lot of things that you really need to figure out who your clients are because you're not here to serve everyone. We're not here to serve them. We're not. Another organization may be able to cater to another group of people, but I just described what our ideal client is. They're people that value their time, that ask the right questions, meaning like they're interested in what benefits this has, and then how much does it cost, and people that really value their privacy and see the importance of it in the physical world, and they want to continue that in the digital world too. Now, that's the ideal client. and then. You know, we would love to cater to everyone, but you're not going to be a very successful business if you're trying to please everyone. You know that saying, if you try and please everyone, you know. So when you have that in your mind, you go, okay, the people that we do and have catered to for Unchained Innovation are those kind of people. And we have some amazing people. You can go on unchainedinnovations.io, look at the reviews and what people have left there. Uh, they're very happy about the uh, transition and what they have seen. Uh, and what they have experienced with these devices is seen in terms of the support and uh, the knowledge base that we provide. We have, uh, for example, audios, videos, walkthroughs, all kinds of stuff so people can really uh, self-educate uh, themselves on how to use these phones and certain things that may come up. So that's the first aspect. The other aspect is like, well, we do have some people that are like, hey, this phone costs, let's say, 1,000 USD or 1,400, 1,499 USD. Uh, it's a bit much for me. Now, that's very interesting because we have had some clients that come in and say that. Then we say, what phone are you currently using? And they say iPhone. And we're like, how much is the iPhone by the time you have gone through your plan? And they'll be like, maybe $2,000, $2,500. If they buy it outright, it's similar prices. So we're like, so it's not more than what you're paying, right? But even if it was a little bit more, wouldn't that be worth it? You know, a spyware device called an iPhone that you have gone and bought and brought into your house yourself, as opposed to a, a phone that's, you know, respecting you. And it's hand in hand with self-sovereignty and self, uh, you know, empowerment. You know, people really start to click over and go, yeah, you're right. You know, it's, it's not more than I thought. Or if it's similar, you know, to what I already have in my hand. Now, again, we do understand it's a big world with a lot of different budget, uh, you know, estimation or what people have available to them. And uh, there are perhaps other people catering to different price points by selling secondhand phones, things like that, but they are compromising certain things. We don't make those compromises. Uh, with Unchained Innovations, all the phones are brand new. They're not secondhand or refurbished phones. Uh, we, you know, we don't deal with that at all. And uh, the service we provide is for people that value an in-depth and uh, accessible level of support. You know, sometimes we get on the phone with people and speak to them for hours to resolve their problem, to help them understand what it is they have in their hand. And uh, if a person wants to just go buy a second-hand phone that has similar features with no support, with someone that just caters to maybe five or 10 people and a real knowledge base, that's up to them. That's up to them. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, for me, I mean, uh, the way I see it is, is like, how would, what is your privacy work to you? That's, I think, I think, I think that's the right question to ask. And, you know, I like, could you really put a number on your privacy on your, on your own, you know, self-sovereignty? And I think that's where, you know, if you zoom out, you realize that paying something like, you know, um, you know, fourteen ninety nine, for example, right, is, uh, I think it's a, it's it's a steal in many ways because, you know, you have finally you have control over your your, your data, you have control over your privacy, you have control over, over over the usage of the apps, even 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 the apps that are already out there that are meant to take all your data, they can't take your data. So I think it's an absolute steal, and personally, I would pay for it very happily, you know. And uh, but. And I think most people, yeah, when you zoom out, you have to, you really realize, you know, this this is this is something that is needed, and it's something that's really worth it. And uh, it also has support and longevity, you know, because a lot of a lot of the phones right now in the market, you know, they come out, you know, they're coming out with a model every single year or every second year, right? And you know, and then after like you know five years, four to five years, you have to have to upgrade, right? But what I think with, the, with what you guys are trying to do is you guys are trying to give them a device that is upgradable, right? If I'm not mistaken, that, that, that is upgradable, that has a support, that has, that has constant support once you buy from the company. A, a, am I correct here? That's correct. Like the phone we're speaking on right now is one of those phones. I have an older version here uh, and, you know, never had an issue with it really. Sometimes there's a small bug um, but it gets fixed in the next update. You'll notice with these phones as well, another huge benefit is that you continuously have updates. Uh, you don't have this with like Samsung phones because if there's an update at a uh, development level, it has to get verified by Samsung. Samsung has to then push it onto its phones. There's a delay. So you, maybe with a Samsung phone, LG phone, you'll have updates maybe once a month, once every two or three months. I literally sometimes have the updates once a week with this phone. So that means if there are any loopholes or any sort of uh, points of attack remaining in a certain protocol of the outdated version of the software, it gets patched very quickly, much quicker than all the other phones that are out there. And uh, that's a very huge aspect as well. In terms of being able to upgrade, uh, can you elaborate on that? No, uh, pardon? In terms of, uh, you said you can upgrade uh, the phone. I just wanted to make sure that expectation is clear. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, let's say if if I buy a device from you, right? How long would I have to go without buying another device? That's that. I think yeah. I, I think that's my main main question. Yeah. Sure. No, that's very important. So it depends. Are you a person that's taking photos, and photos are very good to you? You know, but that's the same as any other phone. If there's a new model that takes better photos and you want that one, we well, can't really upgrade the camera and pull it apart and we upgrade the camera. You know, that's not going to work. If we're talking about updates and the phone not lagging and slowing down, which is called um, planned obsolescence in design and engineering, meaning that as a product ages, it just becomes slower and, you know, a pain to use. So therefore, you force the end user to go and buy a new model. That doesn't happen with this anymore. For example, with these phones, as the new model comes out, they have five years of, of uh, updates, uh, guaranteed updates. So that means for the next five years, you'll, you'll continue to receive updates. Uh, and if not, perhaps for a few more years after that, depending on the model and what's going on. So you're guaranteed five years of uh, support and updates. Uh, sorry, uh, five years of updates. So when you look at it like that, you have a phone that's not uh, designed to go slow as you update and go forward. If, if anything, it removes all the bloatware, so it continues to work. So the real reason why you would upgrade is perhaps the battery might diminish after four or five years. Uh, that can happen because batteries, you know, uh, the more you, they have a certain amount of cycles that you can charge them. And once it reaches a certain point, you might notice that the battery is not holding its original capacity. And now, uh, instead of lasting a whole day, now it's lasting maybe 60% of the day. Uh, if you're savvy, you know, where you can take it to a technician, they can take the battery out and replace it for a new one. So in most cases, people 
surely upgrade their phones within five years, you know, uh, unless they really don't do much with it, which is okay too. If they don't do much with it, then chances are it's going to continue working. Uh, one of the mistakes people make that I really want to bring up here that I notice people do with traditional Android phones, whether it's uh, Samsung or LG or Apple phones such as iPhone, is that because they know updates have changed certain things that I don't like, or updates slow down the phone, they don't update. Now, I fully respect why they haven't. And at the same time, I would love people to realize that when you don't update your software, you're not patching up backdoors that have been found. You're not patching up security issues that have been, uh, for example, explored or noticed. So now you're running an out, you know, most of the hacks and intrusive, uh, let's say, uh, software issues are due to outdated apps. So when you run a phone that hasn't been updated in two years or a year, you're going to run into issues. So if you have a very old Android device and you go into settings and about and you check when the last update took place and what version of, uh, let's say, Android is running on that phone, and if it says like 2016, 17, that means your phone has had let's say six years uh, worth of updates missing from its database. So that means in six years, there could have been hundreds of loopholes in terms of security that, are, that the phone is now exposed to. So sure, you're doing a cool thing where you don't want to update your phone, but you're also keeping yourself uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense in a vulnerable position. So uh, that's also important to keep in mind as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you so much for point, pointing that out. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so I'm definitely going to leave a link to the, uh, to uh, well, where people can buy this from eventually. And, uh, and oh, coming back to, I think I have one more question for you. I mean, regarding Bitopia. And this is, uh, I mean, with Unchained Innovations, are you guys planning to do anything blockchain related, like any tokenization, any tokens coming out uh, or anything, we, whether it's uh, within the unchained innovation space or it's in Bitopia, any any plans for like a tradable coin or anything, anything like that? That's cool. Uh, yeah. I first want to just point out that people with unchained innovations can purchase the phones with cryptos and they are actually given a discount for buying it in cryptos because uh, institutions like Stripe and PayPal take a huge amount of fees. You know, they can take a hundred or two hundred dollars from each transaction, and it, they're not very easy to deal with. So people can pay with cryptos, and it makes the process easier for everyone involved, and they get a discount for paying in crypto because that fee that we usually have to pay for these organizations is passed down, passed back to the uh, you know client because they've chosen to pay with cryptos, and we don't have to you know deal with that anymore. So that's very important. I also want to point out that it's not just phones, it's also uh, laptops and Unchained Innovations also offers international eSIMs, which are very important because often you'll speak to people on Telegram, you will see that they've used their personal phone number to register the Telegram account or their Signal account. So you can have an international anonymous SIM card, which Unchained Innovation provides for people as an extra service, as an add-on service. Meaning that now you can register Signal and Telegram with an anonymous number that has nothing to do with your personal phone number. And you've segregated those two worlds. And it comes with a VPN connection that's also purchased using cryptos. So again, a lot of people mistake VPNs as all being the same. It's not. You know, most people are like, oh, I had McAfee antivirus and they offered the VPN, so I just got that as an add-on phone. And then we're like, no, that's terrible because they have your credit card information, personal information, their VPN clicks, uh, you know, logs your connection. It's just not a good thing. So, you know, the way we do it keeps all of that anonymous and really secure for people. And uh, the same with the laptops as well. We walk people through what apps they need and we set it up the way that they really need to. So just wanted to point that out. In terms of Thank applying you. blockchain and uh, tokenomics and all of that to Unchained Innovation, we're actually exploring turning Unchained Innovation into a DAO. And that way, our community members, people that contribute, and uh, our clients uh, can become stakeholders as a part of Unchained Innovation. 
and vote on directions. We can have a treasury where we can find people that want to help us market and uh, reward people that want to, for example, write articles, make videos, uh, create content, really, and uh, decentralize the project as, as a, into a decentralized autonomous organization and be able to reward users and make it an entity that's not so reliant on its uh, team and uh, its founders, but make it something that, you know, more uh, bottom up and built for people to be a part of. Uh, that's that's one thing we're exploring as well. And if we do that, uh, we'll definitely have a token for it, and people will be able to uh, participate, uh, you know, in, in that particular organization. Amazing, amazing. And uh, I'm sure this is this is all very early right now for you guys because I'm sure you guys are strategizing for that and working things out. But like, if somebody does want to be a stakeholder in on-chain innovations. Um, is there like an end barrier to entry or like is like is there like a certain amount that you need to need to put into the DAO? Like um, or how how does it work exactly? Or, or, or if or, someone is interested in that, they can definitely reach out and uh, we can explore different uh, kind of uh, let's say uh, packages or you know what they need to do and how, what what would be involved. The the more robust uh, approach that we have right now is with Utopia because Utopia is you know, the mother and uh, Unchained would be a child of Utopia, let's say. Uh, Utopia is registered in Wyoming and uh, it's developed uh, for the past three years. Uh, the third year annual report came out. So if people want to come in through Utopia itself, that's much more accessible right now. Whereas Unchained Innovations, uh, what I described to be the DAO still is something that's uh, being researched and discussed. So Bitopia is open for investors. Anyone that wants to participate, uh, they can reach out. And uh, yeah, we, we have tokens allocated for Bitopia University itself, which is registered in Wyoming as a uh, yeah as a as an entity. And uh, we we developed Bitopia quite solid in a way that yeah we will welcome people that understand the value of it and uh, also want to contribute and uh, you know, help us uh, develop it further. That's that's wonderful. I mean, uh, thank you so much, man, for um, you know for your time, for everything that you've shared, man. I mean, it's such a it's refreshing to hear your take on the entire blockchain space. It's refreshing to see what you're doing in the education space, and it's also refreshing what you're doing in the privacy space, man. I mean, I wish you the very best, and um, and I really I'm looking forward to seeing how Unchain Innovation grows into a massive giant and i really wanted to because what you guys are doing is absolutely brilliant uh, and uh um and i'm just uh we're so i'm so honored that you know you took out your time and to speak to us speak to me to talk to you know my, my audience and uh you know at, at the DeFi enthusiast so we, we, i'm really appreciative of that of course and thank you for having me on the show to be able to kind of explore these ideas with you as well and I just want to say later, perhaps we can include a code that's part of your network. So anyone that comes through your network receives a discount on the phone. Um, they get like a complimentary shipping. And uh, also uh, it's good to know that they've come through your network as well. I also want to mention that there are there is a privacy course that will be launched very soon as a part of Unchained Innovation. And that will really help people understand uh, the different applications that are available uh, what messaging apps, what browsers, what VPN, why they're important. And, you know, we do, we really go into all of that and that will give people a better idea on what they can do. And uh, that will be accessed soon as well. So once that's ready and it's live, we'll definitely send you a link. And uh, again, people from your community can use the code that you include and that will give them a, you know, a, a, let's say promotional value uh, as opposed to original value. So. That would be really good as well. And it has a lot of value for people that want to watch and learn. Thank you so much, Amin. We're, I really appreciate that. Absolutely. I, we're going to leave all the links uh, for everything that you guys want to, you know, you guys want to look at entry innovations, you guys want to look at Bitopia. We'll leave all the links uh, in the video description. And um, and uh, thank you so much, Amin. Uh, it's it's been a real pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. Of course. And just to note, if anyone's going through Unchained Innovations through application forms only, so it's not just a shopping card you check out. Uh, the reason that's done that way is that, you know, we really look after our clients. Um, so we want to know what apps 
you're looking to use so we can set expectations, configure it the way that people want it. And it also allows us to filter out people that are not right for us, um, depending on uh, you know, what, what they're after and what they're looking to obtain. So it's just a couple of minute application form comes through and someone will get in touch with you and move forward from there. Awesome, awesome. Awesome, Amin. Thank you so much, man. Do you have any, any, any other thing to add? Ah, sure. Really, I think the message moving forward is that we are so powerful and there are so many tools available to us. And it can be easy to get stuck in a frame of mind where people can become, you know, feel hopeless and lose inspiration. And it's important to realize as much as there are people developing tools of surveillance, AI, and all of this, there are also amazing people developing some powerful projects and have been for a long time uh, that really empower people. And unfortunately, most of the focus by most of the channels and everything is on the fear mongering and all of this. Um, though it's important, that's why on Unchained we explore all these tools and really give people, hey, there are solutions. Let's talk about solutions. It's good to talk about what's happening in the problem. So the message I have for people is that we are all powerful. And as much as there are things happening that we don't like, there are also amazing stuff happening. And really keep up the inspiration and focus on what's happening and see where you can contribute because there are really beautiful things out there that we can use as tools. Absolutely, absolutely. And on that note, guys, this is me, the DeFi enthusiast, and we have Amin Rafi here. Thank you so much, my friend. I, I once again, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. My, my, my pleasure as well. Thank you so much.